what we were concerned about. Uh, we, uh, of course, in those days, we were unable to communicate with the vehicle like you can today. And there was an hour before we knew that we had a successful launch. Uh, my thoughts were that not uh, that we uh, make in history, but we were accomplishing the mission that we were assigned to do. Uh, it was just a complete... Uh, Jubilation by everyone that, that evening. Colonel, we're speaking with Colonel uh, Hill right now, Colonel or Colonel Henry McGill, I'm sorry, Colonel McGill, who is with us. He was here at the launch site 40 years ago tomorrow, January 31st, 1958, when Explorer 1 launched into space, America's very first space satellite. After that satellite went into space, Colonel, uh, did, did you remain a part of the Space Coast community? Well, uh, yes and no, not not physically here, but I did in, in Huntsville. Uh, I was the uh, military agent camp, as I mentioned, too, General Harris, and I traveled with uh, Harris, and also I was administrative agent of Juan Brown uh, on a number of his trips, so I was a bank man. I, I carried all the all the documentation and traveled with them, and, uh, and so I was with the program until NASA was formed, and of course I remained in the Army and did not travel to NASA with the other members of the group. Where do you live today? I live in uh, Melbourne at uh, Sun Tree. Oh, at Sun Tree. Okay, so you eventually made this your home. we got to take a break here. We're going to return. We'll talk some more with Colonel McGill. We've got Jim Banky here from the Florida Today Space Online. Cliff Lethbridge is on hand, who wrote an absolutely fabulous account of the Explorer 1 rocket launch. And uh, we'll do all that and more as we continue with WMMB's live morning show broadcast from the United States Air Force Space and Missile Museum, located at the Canaveral Air Station, where tomorrow the entire community is invited to come on out and uh, celebrate the 40th anniversary of that launch of Explorer 1. We'll be right back after this.
Everybody in the crew had one drink. There you go. All right. Then what a way to do it. Jay Campbell is our guest here this morning. And uh, once again, we're uh, visiting with some of the people who were on hand during the launch of the oh, Frank. Explorer 1 hey, Frank. Uh, rocket 40 years ago tomorrow. And uh, once again, that's the anniversary that they'll be celebrating. And you are invited to come up. Now, surprisingly enough, Jay, I don't think a lot of people know they're wondering to come to this museum. And that's right. Whenever there's a launch operation, there's a safety or security. How many, how many people were involved with this? I mean, how many, how many 
men did it take to launch that first satellite, men and women? Uh, uh, they were directly involved in, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about everyone who was involved with putting a screw in it, but I mean, uh, how big was the team? Well, I know we, we brought somewhere near 75 people came down with the group I was with, and, uh, and then you had your launch control group here. I later transferred down to this group along with, uh, uh, you've got Terry Greenfield in there you need to talk to in particular. We're talking right now with Norm Terry. Let me ask you this, Norm. What was the what was the mood if you could measure or the mood of the country after Explorer One and went into space? Was it was, was there immense jubilation? Yes, I, it, it was just unbelievable. You have to realize uh, that we launched and we had to wait 90 minutes or 89 minutes to know if it was in orbit. And and now we have satellites that we know that, but uh, it, it was almost a hush situation. For 90 minutes, and yes. then the whole country, everywhere you went, it was like the, the Apollo or the shuttle launch. I mean, it was just great to know that you put something up uh, that's circling here. Uh, how, how come it was at nighttime? Why not a daytime launch? Things happen at certain times, and you had to visually track the rocket. So by doing it long, everyone on the Space Coast who's seen the night launch knows you can follow it a lot longer at night than during the day. And that's the simple reason you had to be able to see it. Uh, Frank Childers is here. Frank, come on over here. <coughs> Want to talk to you a little bit. You got a new book coming out yeah, here. It's uh -huh. called uh, Faith in Space. Okay, this book was uh, starting, you might say, with uh, Explorer launch uh, for one. Were we you, did, were you here? Yeah, yeah, Explorer one, the block up here on the weighing machines. The weighing machines were my responsibility yeah. for all four of these pads. Now, I got to stop there because <laughs> when you come here, you're going to see these huge scales and you're going to want to know more about it because uh, they're very, very impressive. You had four of them? Yes, we had one on each pad. We had two mechanical scales and two electronic scales with load cells underneath the one pad. All electronic. We had to calibrate these things, these pads, with 5,000 pound weights lifted by a crane. You know, the full range of the fully fueled vehicle, like from zero to about 75,000 pounds. And what was the main reason for weighing a rocket before you launched it? All right, we could see uh, the boil off is liquid oxygen, for one thing. Uh, another thing, we had to know the tear weight of each vehicle, uh, each missile, as it uh, left the pad, so we'd know if it, if it blew up, we could calculate uh, exactly where it would impact by knowing the, the liftoff weight, they, some way they could back that into the formula having to do with locating where it might explode and land. So those, uh, those weight measurements are very important. Very good. And you will see that scale when you come into this blockhouse here on your visit to the uh, Air Force Space and Missile Museum. You'll look for that and you'll say, hey, I heard that guy that put them together on the air, Frank Childers. And now, Frank, tell me about your book, Faith well, in Space. This book is about starting with astronomers. I've tried to develop uh, the definition of space, you know, early in the... In the
Okay, Randy, we just wanted to get uh, some reflections from you on Explorer 1. This is the 40th anniversary. Could you first uh, state your name and what your, what your role was during the launch of Explorer 1? I'm Randy Yeomans, and I was with Missile Electrical. We handled all the wiring and, elect and the uh, relays and uh, boxes on board the, the missile. And you recall where you were, you know, during the launch of Explorer 1, where on the ground you would have been? I was in the parking lot watching. And about how far away was that from the blockhouse? Oh, from the blockhouse here, it was about four or five blocks. And just describe what your activities were, you know, during the launch preparations, what you did, and uh, in, in the time leading up to the launch. We worked at the pad right out by the missile itself. And we had the office was actually in the structure out at the pad. And we took care of all the missile electrical. Do you have any outstanding memories about it? Anything that you, you know, it was 40 years ago, but do you remember how you felt, or you felt, did you feel proud, or uh, you know, was it just so busy you didn't really think about it? Two things stand out in my mind, and the first one was uh, the, ex the uh, first satellite they tried to launch and missed. I watched the Vanguard, I watched it explode standing right out there. And uh, that was not a good feeling, and then I remember the night they launched Explorer 1. A lot of fun. And just, just very briefly, what did you do after Explorer 1 and, uh, you know, not 40 years worth, but what, what was your basic career path after that? Went on to uh, Saturn V and worked over there until I retired in 1980. Okay. Okay. I'll speak loud. Uh, Sam? Sam could, Grimbley. Okay, could you uh, first just state your name and what your role was during the launch of Explorer 1? What was my goal? What, state your name and what, you, what your role Samuel was. Samuel Grimbley. I was on the launch pad with right up to time of launch almost, and we had to go back to the callback area. This is quite some, something to st see all these guys back here, you know, it's, well, it was actually on the launch team. So... My goal was, was to stay with them as long as I could. And I did all up, right up to the first shuttle launch. So at, at the Explorer 1, I actually was military. So it's been a long way coming up. But uh, that's about it. Now they call, they call you Sarge, is that yeah. because that's what your rank was? Yeah. But we. Right on the pad, we stayed on the pad, I presume, what, three days we didn't get off the pad? For about three days, we sit right on the pad out there, waiting for clearance where we could get ready to launch. And what did you do specifically on the pad? I was propulsion airframe, and uh, we, done it, we were kind of a jack of all trades. Anything that had to be done on the vehicle, we did. We opened up that vehicle for the electrical people to get in, check everything out. And when we got ready to go, we had to close up, go back to the fallback area, and then they launch. Sometimes it didn't work that way. Sometimes it took a little bit longer than they thought they would be, take. But it's quite memories back there. Now we're going to ask everybody the same thing. Do you have any outstanding memory of that night itself? No, I know. We, we were tired. All, the whole crew was pretty well tired. <laughs> We've been on... We'd been on the pad for so long, and it was just, we were in hopes that it would go. Von Braun said, okay, we've got to put one up, so we did. The only thing is the Navy said that they were had to call the military ahead to get their satellite up. Well, the vehicle that we actually launched it on had been checked out and ready to launch four months before Polaris. But there's big politics going on, and they wouldn't let us launch. So they finally got it down here and got it off. But it was four months after the original date they had scheduled to go up. And Von Braun was quite perturbed about that. The little grapefruit rolled around the pad out there from, uh, from uh, the Navy, Navy vehicle. It didn't go very far. So we were sitting over on the pad over here when that went off. But we were just waiting for it to get down here. And that's, that's about it. Okay, Sarge, I think that'll do it. Okay. Thanks very much for your...
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember the papers being in mothballs up there. I was sitting in mothballs up at Huntsville, ready to go. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, Jay, if you would for me, uh, uh, state your name and if possible, the title that you held uh, at, during launch of Explorer 1. Jay Campbell, and I was the uh, pad foreman for Mechanical Propulsion Group on the pad. And what did you do? Uh, you know, just give us a rundown of what your activities were on the launch day. Oh, we checked out the power plant, did all the tests, uh, et cetera, and secured the vehicle and got it ready for launch. And and during the launch now, you had already said you were at, you were out at the, uh, the checkpoint down the road, is that correct? Yes, at T-minus 10 minutes, uh, we had to leave the pad, yes. Mm -hmm. And do you have any outstanding memories of mm -hmm. watching the launch or just the general feel of uh, putting it all together, how you felt? Well, we were real glad that we could uh, finally get the chance to, to launch because uh, we felt we could do it even before Vanguard. But that was the general feeling. God, we finally got a chance to do it. Let's do it and get it out of here, and, and off we go. Mm -hmm. Now, once you were done, were there a great deal of celebration afterward with uh, some of the guys? Did you get together afterward and celebrate? or? We did a little celebrating at the launch complex, uh -huh. but uh, everybody was excited after it was launched. That's when the excitement came, when, when it passed the, the final tracking station, and the announcement came that it did go over Goldstone and we are in orbit and the free world's first, uh, first satellite. And if you could, you know, what would you like people to most remember about it? We're at the 40th anniversary. What, you know, in light of what you remember about it, what do you think you'd like people to remember about it most? Well, it was the uh, beginning of space and <clears throat> a lot of dedicated people and, um, and especially the, um, the German team. They started us off in space and uh, a lot of people have forgotten about that, but we do owe them, uh, Von Braun's team, uh, a debt of gratitude for getting us in when, when it really came in handy. Uh, that was the beginning of the Cold War, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, part of history. We'll never forget that. Okay, Jay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Can we take that off? No, no, you're good. Yeah, I just wanted to check something there. If you have the peroxide leak was the one that put it to 1048. It was a blue <laughs> Uh, Lionel, is that correct? Ed. Oh, Ed, okay. Right. Ed, could you state your name and, uh, if, if you recall, the title that you had during the launch of Explorer 1? Well, basically, I, I was the uh, pad engineer for mechanical and propulsion. Uh, I uh, had the checklist that uh, we used to conduct the countdown to check off the items as they, as they were accomplished. Uh, we, uh, which included loading propellants, by the way. We were right there during LOX loading and hydrogen peroxide loading. That was that would be unheard of today, of course. Well, let's expand on that a little bit. That was a, a day when you actually had you know men go out very shortly before the launch and fix that's things. Right. Could you describe that's, that a little bit? Well, a few days before launch, we'd load the uh, the the fuel, which was uh, well, it was was toxic. It was UDMH, uh, so it was a it was a bad stuff to handle. We had to wear a scape and that sort of thing. Uh, but that was usually days in advance because that material was stable in terms of there was no temperature wise it was stable but uh, locks we loaded during the countdown and of course being locked it would boil off and we had to have replenishment uh, capability which we had so it was constantly the locks tank was constantly topped off the last thing we loaded was the hydrogen peroxide which provided uh, well it was, de it was catalyzed and decomposed into steam which drove the uh, engine turbine which drove the pumps which uh, provided uh, propellants for the uh, thrust chambers. And now where were you at physically, uh, e either pre-launch or during the launch itself? Right at the base, right up against the bird uh, at, at the launcher. Usually around the, uh, we had a uh, pneumatic panel that was mounted to the, uh, to the launcher. So we were generally right in that area and the, the uh, connection of the uh, thrust chamber igniter and our main stage stick occurred right there. Now back to that uh, hydrogen peroxide leak. That was the that was the, the the event that caused the major delay from 10:30 to 
approximately 1048, 15 minute delay or so. <laughs> do, you, do you recall you know, the activity surrounding that, how uh, you heard about it, what you did? Uh, yeah, very vividly. As a matter of fact, uh, our boss, Albert Zeiler, uh, his uh, Pina Mundi experience suggested he go around the vehicle, you know, patting the fence and checking their rudders and so on and so forth. And so he was uh, doing that final check, his visual check, and uh, noticed a condition on one of the rudder housings. And he said, what is this, Fanning? <laughs> Well, I said, that's peroxide, Albert. It was uh, foaming at the, at the base of the, uh, or bottom of the uh, rudder housing. So uh, Jay Campbell, the fellow just, just spoke to you. Um, we opened up the tail door. And he went inside with some wet, wet cloth rags and uh, cleaned up the tail as, as good as could be done at that point. And uh, closed back up and proceeded. We had a the, the basic cause of the leak had to do with, we had a little different configuration we had had in the past. We had an overboard uh, line. In order to achieve the full burn time, we actually overflowed the hydrogen peroxide into a, back into a hydrogen peroxide trailer. Well, this vent line that uh, also provided the overflow material um, had a slight crack. It was a bellows type line. Uh, that occurred as a result of venting the, venting the tank. It was a line that was not really uh, of sufficient strength to withstand the, the vent that we, uh, that we had. Anyhow, that had dripped for some period of time, obviously, since we loaded peroxide. So as a part of that closeout going back in, uh, Jay lifted up that line. We got the remaining residual peroxide out of that line, and that took care of it. And at that time, now that was ballpark 45 minutes or so before launch, or it was not too far. How many, about how many people were, would have been out at the, the base at that time? Well, all of our uh, mechanical people, all of the, uh, uh, all of our mechanics, uh, probably some of the electrical technicians were, were still there, some of them. But uh, I don't know, what, half a dozen, 10, 50, something like that. Okay, well, first of all, we appreciate the detail on that because that's far greater than anything that we've seen written down. Uh, do you have any other outstanding memories, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, you, you were a part of history? I mean, did, does it still move you to think about it? Well, we knew, of course, it was uh, pretty significant. As had mentioned, been, been mentioned earlier, the Vanguard in December uh, uh, basically lost thrust at liftoff and crashed back onto their pad and blew all the pieces. Uh, we knew that... Uh, we could have done that uh, probably a year or so ahead of, of that. And Sputnik had already been up, and they launched uh, Sputnik 2, I guess, in November of, uh, what, 57. We could have beat both of those. So we, uh, I guess we were pretty proud that we were, we were first. And in, in the paper news uh, media, the mostly newspapers back in those days, uh, uh, applauded our efforts, I guess you'd say. You know, Put, put smiles back on the American public. Okay, and we appreciate that very much. Thanks. Terry Greenfield? Yeah. Quiet on the set, please. Uh, Terry, just a uh, yeah, quick we're done. Let let me have your name and uh, what your title was back at Launch of Explorer 1. Okay, my name is Terry Greenfield. Uh, I didn't really have a title back in those days. I was a, a blockhouse engineer who was responsible for the uh, speed control system of the, uh, of the tub, which we called the, the basic uh, structure that held the, the uh, sergeant rockets. And uh, my job was to, uh, actually I also served a little bit in the uh, liaison world with uh, the JPL folks because we had to balance it over in the spin test facility, which is kind of adjacent to the pad here. And we spent lots of hours and lots of nights getting the thing balanced properly to bring over and for installation on the pad. But on the launch day there, uh, that was one of the last things that we did <clears throat> was to uh, bring the, the tub up to a uh, liftoff speed. But to do that, uh, we really didn't have any switches to control the power to the box. And uh, what I used to have to do was to go up and and at that time, we cooled the instrument area with uh, carbon dioxide gas, and uh, or carbon dioxide, uh, actually dry ice. And uh, I used to have to take a breath and then reach my face in and, and hook up the cables there. And uh, 
Then we'd close it out and come back in the blockhouse, and then we'd run it up to uh, somewhere around 350 RPM, uh, right slightly before launch, which uh, really caused a problem with the guidance and control panel because of the vibration. But during flight, we had a programmer that, that brought it up to uh, somewhere around 700 RPM because as, as you burn off fuel, the actual the mode, the, the vibration mode would change uh, in the rocket, and you didn't want to disturb the, uh, the, the guidance platform there. So uh, that was my job. I operated the firing console, uh, the one on the left side. Uh, and uh, I, I don't see a picture in there at all with that, with that but it's a pretty good picture of, of the I folks in there. I seem to recognize your, pic your face in the... I'm the, old, right I'm the old fellow way back in the corner, yeah. No, way I, in I'm back. trying to picture, but you're, you're in the picture that we have in the blockhouse. Yeah. Now, it looks like 40 years have been kind to you. How old were you at the launch of Explorer? I was 27, man. Tw uh, 28, really. 28 years old, yeah. And you're one of the veterans that was actually in the firing room. Right, it was one of the five, uh, five folks there. The, I guess there was myself and uh, C. Downing Sweat, who I think uh, passed away. Uh, there was uh, uh, Carl Whiteside, Ike Ridgel, uh, Curly Chandler, or W. Dean Chandler, either one. And then Bob Moser was the test conductor then. And, uh, now you remember, just tell us a little bit about the, the mood in the blockhouse. I mean, it was a lot of work, you know, long day in preparation, two days of scrubs before. And what was the general attitude and mood like? Well, it was real upbeat. I mean, people were, they wanted to get this thing in orbit. And, uh, of course, it was, the, you know, the hour and 20-something minutes where it was really a quiet time until we heard from uh, Old Stone and Antigua, I think, the, the message came in that it was in orbit. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember any big celebration. I think everybody was uh, kind of tired. And uh, those days, people were different. They, they didn't go party that much. At least, at least the people I knew didn't party that much. They kind of were uh, very competent folks. Uh, I like to say in those days that uh, people were more important than paper. I think the whole space program has really gotten to where it's, it doesn't rely on the people as much as they rely on the paper. And, uh, and that's, that's not, uh, not the way we used to do things. So. Now, any other specific memories about Explorer 1? You know, this, the, the blockhouse perspective is a, is a kind of a unique one. No, of course there was the, there was the, uh, the vein problem there where the and that may have been part of the peroxide problem. You know, that peroxide may have leaked into there. No. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what happened is at the very last minute when they turned rudder drive on, which was the, which was put power onto the control motors for the vanes, uh, the indications show that one of the vanes was out. And in fact, when Debus turned around and looked out the window there, he he uh, said everything's fine. And uh, so we went ahead and and a little little. You weren't really sure that was the case, but it, everything worked out fine. And uh, they actually, uh, I guess a, several weeks later, they had Fred Friendly and, and Edward R. Murrah came down, and we did a movie in there. They bought us all shirts. And uh, they really over-dramatized when, when Kurt Debus had turned around and said, forget it, you know, which is something you'd really never do in a, in a firing room, say, forget it. But uh, Well, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> I wish we had all day to talk about that, because yeah. we... The, apparently the films and the tapes of the original firing have been either destroyed or disappeared, or we oh, we, we searched for over four but, months now to find but them. But there should be a, a commercial film with that Fred right, Friendly. We, that's all. That Fred is Friendly's available. still alive. Yeah. And the the question is, you you remember the the firing itself, and you I'm sure have seen the film that you were in that, where they bought the shirts and did that. Right. Was it a fairly good representation, or do you say was it over dramatized? I think it was over dramatized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was more, you were more down to business, quiet, very professional. That's right, yeah, and, right. And, and Debus didn't say forget it. I think he said a little more than forget it. Do you remember it at all? <laughs> he said, I, I think he said uh, more like uh, everything, you know, I've, I've seen it, everything's fine, go ahead. But forget it was, uh, was, the, was the word in the, in the show there. Yeah, we have that. That's the one we're going to be broadcasting tomorrow over the PA system. Oh, we, okay. We, record, we know that it's a... Uh, Simulation. We're kind of disappointed we couldn't find. Oh, you don't it have originally. the real. You don't have the real tapes then. We couldn't find it. JPL didn't have it. Uh, nobody. Yeah. Uh, Pentagon, uh, Redstone, nobody had it. We were hoping one of the veterans yeah. would, but we couldn't get that. Either. We kept up often with some of the JPL folks there because they got to know them pretty well. Al Wolf used to come down in some of the deep space probes there, but I think John Small. I think he's passed away. Dr. Frolic. I'm not sure whether he's still living. Uh, Wilkie Talbert. I don't. Uh, I lost track of him. Yeah, I think Jim Ryman is the only one I think still lives in Titusville. I uh, didn't see any JPL folks here today either. So. No, maybe tomorrow. Oh. 
just state your name and what your uh, title or what your role was during the launch of Explorer 1. Frank Coppage. I worked with uh, telemetry and radar and command receivers. Of course, the radar was for tracking, and the command receivers were in case there was some problem with the missile, they could destroy it so that it wouldn't cause any damage. And then telemetry was to relay back all of the information from the missile to know the health of the missile, to wh how it was going. And uh, back then, the telemetry was, wasn't quite so sophisticated because uh, they used uh, electronic tubes and the equipment needed to be uh, tweaked up. They had the subcarrier oscillators for the different informations, had a, had a low side and a high side, and it was always, always fun to tune them up because we had to go out and tune them up, uh, tweak them up just a little before the launch, uh, at least within probably about 15 minutes before. And we had a man back at the uh, telemetry station over at the hangar, and he would talk to us and he'd say, well, we'd, we'd get the side low on the low side, high on the high side, and which sounds kind of funny, but you had to make sure that it didn't drift too far below or too high. And then we would uh, safety wire the, uh, the unit, close the doors and come back in the blockhouse and then watch it, we'd, we'd record it on the uh, tape recorder and watch the monitors to make sure that all of the, that the radar was okay and command receivers and so forth. And that, that was real interesting. So because back then it was a lot of fun because we, we worked in the, in the blockhouse with equipment and we went out and worked on the vehicle and we didn't, didn't have uh, subcontractors and so forth like, like they do now. So, so we were actually hands-on type. Uh, so are you one of, the one, one of the veterans that was actually in the blockhouse then for the launch itself? Yes. And where would you have been stationed approximately in the blockhouse, in the firing room itself? Yeah, in the firing room, <clears throat> they had a tape recorder there, and then there was some monitors for the uh, telemetry. They had the main telemetry station back over at the hangar where they were recording everything, but we also recorded it in the blockhouse. And, and uh, like you were one that was that you were in the blockhouse and then out on the pad and, or, and then back in the blockhouse. Just, could you yes. elaborate on that a little and bit they, more? What you of course, did they sealed place. up the doors before launch to, for safety purposes. And then, then we, we were, of course, extremely interested in watching all of the signals. And then when it got down and past a certain milestone and separation and so forth. And when it finally got into orbit, there, there was a lot of uh, cheering and so forth in the blockhouse. And it, it, was, it was really good because uh, here on the, you know, you know the uh, missile out on the pad is not very far from the blockhouse. O over when the shuttle goes, you're three miles back. But it, it was, you could look out the window and see how things were going. Were and you able to glance away from your, your equipment to, to see the rocket actually uh, launch then? Some, sometimes we were able to look out. And back then, the, the missile sat there and it had this big boom that came up with the, uh, all of the cables and so forth. And then that would separate and the boom would go down just before launch. And so you recall actually seeing the rocket launched that night? I uh, was watching the telemetry, and we were looking. There were lots of lots of heads there. We were back a little bit way, and they were we could see through between heads, and you know, see 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 the firing up of the missile, right? Now, somewhere in the block, guys, there was a plotting board where they were actually uh, Dr. Stuhlinger, I believe, was doing the, the they were doing calculations to determine when to do the firing of the upper stages, and uh, were you involved in that at all, or were you just Well, not, not really on the plotting board, no. Uh, Carl Sendler, one of the Germans, was the head of the RF and telemetry group, and then uh, one of our supervisors was Grady Williams, and uh, Jim Rorix was with telemetry, so all of those, 
early guys uh, really, really mean a lot to us when, when we can see them anymore. And now looking back, you know, do you have any outstanding memories of that particular day or that night? Well, just, just the fact that, as we've talked about, uh, the excitement of the fact that uh, we knew that the other attempt had not been successful. And this uh, Jupiter C-type missile, which was a redstone with extended tanks on it, we had fired one of those the year before and knew that it would, could be fired successfully, and we were making sure that we believed surely that this one was going to make it. Was there throughout that period a sense of, uh, you know, were you agitated at all because you knew you could do it but you weren't given the chance to do it? Well, there was a little bit of that, of course, because uh, when they decided who would actually do it. Okay, we're continuing from the other tape. I just want to ask you, you know, about there was some, I guess, controversy, and I think the Eisenhower administration was questioned a little bit about the selection of the official satellite program. Vanguard had been selected over Orbiter when the Army knew they had a vehicle that could launch a satellite 13 months before the Russians launched Sputnik 1. Mm -hmm. And you were commenting on that, you know, was there a sense of rivalry? Was there a sense of agitation that you knew that you could have done this before and you weren't given the chance? Well, there's always a competitive spirit, you know. And, and we were a little disappointed when it wasn't chosen, but when the Vanguard was, we were all pulling that it would go. And when, it, when they had a mishap, it was decided, uh, Dr. Vaughn Brown told him that uh, he thought he could launch it within, I don't know whether it said a month or two months or whatever, but they uh, took it, brought it down from Huntsville, put it on the pad, and we checked it out. And sure enough, everybody was real happy that it really did make a successful, the major, missile went, and the, all of the spin-up rockets, those three stages, there were a bunch that went first, and then three, and then the final stage was, was a live uh, rocket itself, and it ended up in orbit with the, with the casing and the electronic equipment right in the nose of that thing, and that was the first, uh, sat first satellite, Explorer 1. And you, you would reflect that you were proud for the country, regardless of who was actually doing the launch itself. Yes, indeed. We were very uh, happy to know that uh, it did what we thought it would do. And, you know, everybody was cheering in the blockhouse. And we were real happy when we finally heard that it was actually in orbit. Okay, Frank, thanks a lot. We appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, Henry, if you would uh, state your name and, and what your title was uh, during launch activities for Explorer 1. Uh, my name is Henry McGill. I was a lieutenant, aide de camp to Major General John Medeiros, the uh, commander of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, and I was with him the night, uh, the night of, the, of the firing. Now, you had a very interesting story about that. Uh, you, you were in, actually in the firing room for the launch of Explorer 1. Could you just describe how that came about? Well, the uh, number of people permitted in the blockhouse were limited, and Medeiros wanted me to be with him. Uh, so uh, they gave me a job, because uh, no one was permitted in unless they had a job to do, and I had, to, uh, re had a remote camera to operate. Uh, that was uh, my function, and uh, uh, I'm sure it could have been handled by anyone else, but he wanted me to be there because it was a history-making event. And I'm sure one of the reasons was that you had been involved in Huntsville with, uh, you know, a lot of the experiences that had led up to the launch of Explorer 1. Uh, you were actually a, a go, kind of a go-between between Medeiros and the Van Braun design team, is that correct? Well, I was, being an aide-de-camp, I was administrative uh, uh, assistant to Medeiros and also to Dr. Von Braun. I traveled with uh, each of these two men for about three years uh, as an administrative assistant. Uh, but the interesting fact about the, this particular missile launch was the decision to launch. Uh, the night of Friday, the night that the Russians launched their Sputnik, there was a visiting team at Huntsville 
uh, the new Secretary of Defense designee, Neil McElroy. He had with him the Secretary of the Army, Wilbur Brucker, and Lieutenant General, General Jim Gavin, the Director of the Army Research and Development. Uh, they were present, and the word came in that the Russians had launched the satellite, which is the way we got that word, rather interested, by the way, of London Times. Uh, Von Brown, uh, I was sent to pick him up at his home because he was going to attend the, the dinner. Banderas did not want anyone else to see him before he had the chance to talk to him about the launch. So I picked up uh, Dr. Von Brown, uh, brought him to the uh, dinner, and the next morning we had a four-hour uh, plan to uh, brief the secretary on the Army's uh, Jupiter program, and uh, the uh, briefing was changed uh, to reflect that we, the Army, could put up a satellite. And Von Brown made the statement, uh, we can put it up in 60 days. Medeiros uh, changed, they said, make that 90, Warner. And then they tried to press the secretary for decision. But he stood up at 12 o'clock and says, I know when I've been pressured. And uh, said, uh, we are, you'll hear from us later. And got in his airplane, flew back to Washington. Now, this in actuality was well after uh, the Vanguard program had been chosen. That, that happened in 55. You're talking now about October 57. Yes. What, what transpired in the meantime? Well, actually, the Army, uh, Von Brown's uh, uh, team, uh, working with the Navy Research Laboratory, uh, proposed the orbiter. Uh, they put up a satellite. Uh, however, uh, I think the American Rock Society was instrumental in getting that attention given to to the orbiter program to, to through the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, but a decision was made uh, for the uh, International Geophysical Year to go with a non-military weapon system, which was Vanguard. And the Vanguard was selected a much more sophisticated delivery system than the Redstone, and it was selected for the, for the IGY. Now, were you aware, you know, during that interim period, were you aware of what the attitude was of, uh, of General Medeiros. Now, he, he did some, made some decisions without official authorization. Were you privy to those? Did you know what was going on? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know particularly what you were speaking of, but yes, uh, I was aware. Of after we, we, the Army, fired the Jupiter C, uh, the first uh, uh, payload that was uh, to check out the ablative cooling of a, on a nose cone, uh, we were going to use that system and propose that system for the satellite. Uh, Medeiros was told uh, to, we had six missiles. We fired uh, three of them. We had three in reserve, and, and we could have placed the satellite up because they had the sufficient power to do so. Medeiros was told to, to uh, get rid of them. He did not. He took them off the cape here, flew them back, and put them in a the warehouse in Huntsville. Uh, and that was the system that was eventually used. Right. But well, I guess what I was referring mm -hmm. to specifically is that he was he placed the remaining Jupiter C's in storage without having received any authorization to that's prepare correct. for the launching of the satellite. That's correct. Y you were aware of this? Uh, yes, that's that's correct. He, uh, he uh, was told to get rid of them, so he uh, put them in storage. Did not... Uh, and that was uh, a good move on his part. Well, that, that, that was the hardware available for the Explorer. Would you kind of characterize, you know, General Medeiros is, is deceased as of 1990, so we couldn't have him here for the anniversary, but characterize how his personality, uh, you know, played into the fact that the infrastructure was there to launch a satellite when it was launched. Well, he uh, obviously was... Uh, wanting to uh, get permission to put uh, satellite up. He was told uh, not to discuss it and uh, stay clear of the political uh, aspects of, in the uh, so-called uh, inter-service rivalry we had at the time with the, between the Air Force and the Army. It was a real situation. Uh, both uh, services were developing the same type of weapon, uh, Jupiter, and Red, uh, Jupiter and the Thor were each 1,500-mile IRBM missiles. Uh, he had a, a job to, uh, you know, to develop that, and he, uh, he had all the power to do it, and he exercised uh, management uh, control that uh, was new uh, 
to the, certainly to the Army in those days. But there was a lot of competition between the two, but it was, it was a healthy competition. He and Jonas Freeber were good friends, and uh, uh, contrary to what you might read in the paper, so we as an organization, ABMA, in the Western Development Division of the Air Force, uh, got along real well. And we exchanged uh, uh, briefings uh, between the two organizations. And, uh, but uh, Madaris, uh, when the decision was made for the for the Air Force to take over operation and control of the Jupiter, I mean, he, he didn't fight that, although there was a general court-martial in Huntsville by General Colonel Nickerson, who uh, on his own tried to fight it, and uh, he, he uh, passed out information that it should not have, and it resulted into a general court, a so-called Billy Mitchell Court of the Missile Game. But uh, he was against uh, the, the direct uh, orders of Madaris. Okay, let's get back to the launch of Explorer 1. Again, you were in the blockhouse. Do you have any specific memories of Amy? You, you had to do something that could have been done by someone else so that you could be in the blockhouse. Did that give you time then to do more observing of what was going on? Well, no, I, I, uh, I was the same problem as the gentleman just spoke. Uh, I, I had to look between the heads to see the actual uh, missile leave the pad, uh, but there, of course at 11 o'clock at night, uh, there was uh, obviously a, a flash from the propulsion and uh, we were able to see that. Uh, the interesting fact was that the second stage had to be manually controlled as far as the ignition of it from the ground. Uh, Dr. Stuhlinger and, and Dr. Hauserman uh, were the two that were actually plotting against a normal trajectory, and the Stuhlinger was the one that uh, pressed the button for the second stage. Uh, once that happened, that's not anything more that we could do at the at the Cape or at the blockhouse. So the uh, group of Madaris and Dr. Froelich from JPL uh, and I uh, drove over to, uh, the, to Patrick Air Force Base to the theater where the press was assembled. And we did not know uh, whether or not the missile had been su successful. But uh, word finally came in and, uh, and uh, said that they had uh, acquired it in the West Coast, made a successful uh, flight. And uh, my uh, memory of it uh, was that we, we accomplished what we set out to do. Uh, we put a satellite in orbit and hopefully regain some of the prestige in the scientific community in the, in the Western world. And do you remember the uh, famous note, uh, Goldstone has the bird, that Madaris received at Patrick? Uh, I do remember because I delivered it to him. Uh, it was given to me uh, by uh, one of Dr. Bob Brown's uh, uh, I don't remember the gentleman's name. He was a PFC, PhD, but he was a, uh, a PhD in physics, I believe. But he had just gotten the information and wrote the parameters of the period, the apogee, and and uh, uh, and uh, perigee. I guess both, all three. He got the three parameters and wrote him a piece of paper, and I took him down in front of the theater and gave him a dares. I had attempted to call out to the Cape to get the information myself, but they did not have a Class A phone in the theater, and I only had to use a pay phone, <laughs> and I didn't have change. I borrowed change uh, from an Air Force officer, as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, made the call, but during the, that time, uh, interval, the information came in. Uh, and then the uh, General Yates, who was commander of the Eastern Test Range, uh, made a call to and Madaris to Secretary of the Army and, and Chief of Staff of the Army was assembled uh, in the Pentagon in the Operations Center. Uh, Von Brown and Dr. Uh, Bill Pickering and Van Allen were in Washington at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and that's when Ruck, uh, Rucker said the name of this is Explorer. And that's where that, we did not have that name until last it was successfully launched. Okay, Henry, unless there's anything you want to add, anything else? That no, you I think that's uh, about the best of my memory. We spent some extra time. You okay, I won't go into the details about how uh, the res Kelly Fiorentino and uh, my uh, area of expertise is the, the struck command system on the vehicle. And uh, what I wanted to talk about and carry on from what the Colonel says about second stage ignition. At that particular time, as you know, the Vanguard blew up and we had to go ahead. He, he covered a lot of that, I'm sure. Um, we had to come up with uh, an ideal 
uh, how to more or less make sure that we got this uh, explorer in a circular orbit. So uh, the part that I play, which was I was a very young engineer, uh, was that uh, my system, as most of the systems here, most of the equipment that we had on our vehicles is the vehicle transmits and the ground picks it up. My system was the transmitters from the ground transmits to the vehicle. It was the only system was that transmit to the vehicle. So what happens was uh, we had German scientists in Hangar D with uh, like a Ouija board, which was the first calculator, by the way, and they uh, were with, with uh, Captain Henry Paul with a headset, and I was sent to an island called San Salvador. Our uh, transmitters here at the Cape was 1,000 watts or 600 watts the max, and down there at San Salvador, which is the island of the Caribbean, our transmitter was a 10KW, which was much more powerful and stronger. So at that time, we didn't know whether how strong a signal we need to more or less capture the receiver and decoders and transmit second stage ignition. Now, to get second stage ignition, and if you understand the curvature of the Earth, and you had to have uh, the vehicle, the Explorer, had to be at what we call apex. Apex is the highest and on a, a horizontal plane with uh, the Earth. Because if you try to exp uh, hit second stage ignition while the, the vehicle was pointing down to Earth, it would crash to Earth, or are. if it uh, wasn't at the horizontal stage properly, and has to be uh, kicked in at 24,000 miles per hour so it to spin around the Earth uh, properly, or else it would be an egg-shaped orbit. So uh, they would send me a code word down to San Salvador, Henry Paul, and we had, uh, we had uh, second stage ignition down there. Now, when I went down there, like I say, I was pretty young and scared because the Pan American RCA employees down there didn't want to have nothing to do with me because they didn't want to be accused of uh, anything that went wrong. So they come with a Jeep, picked me up at the airport, drove me right to this uh, uh, building, which was nothing more than Quatset Hut with an antenna on top of it, gave me the key to the building and says, it's all yours. <laughs> and uh, we scrubbed. Uh, I, I, uh, I thought we only scrubbed once, but on Dr. Devis's memoirs, which I had with me when he was told to, uh, was invited to go to Russia in the 70s to give the space program documentation about uh, Peter Mundy and the Germans coming to America, and I didn't want to go into that. Uh, he mentioned uh, uh, us, go, us, me being there on that San Salvador Island, sending second stage ignition uh, with the 10 KWs. That's about all I could give you right now, unless you want me to continue talking about little stories. Yeah, just stories. Make, could, uh, I don't know, do we have the badge good enough that we can get yeah. his name off it? Okay, yeah, could we appreciate that because... Well, the badges we had originally were round badges. This came afterwards. When we were, the round badges was Army ballistic missile badges, which this is one also, but they were round badges with just our picture on it and our and, and name. They weren't fine like this. We didn't have no money in them days. Uh, I just came, I came from Patrick Air Force Base, you know, and we were, I was flying B-17s and B-29s, and the Air Force part that they played, as he, uh, Colonel knows, was they, they were taking care of security, the range, opening, you know, flying the B-17s, making sure the fishing boats were out of the area, and the B-29s were electronic gears, flying down range and carrying the photographers to the islands. Uh, the tracking station at that particular time was no, no farther than Grand Turk. We didn't take, we didn't open up Aleutian Island, the 5,000 mile area at that particular time, yeah. I think that about covers it. That was a <coughs> no, I'll do Harry, two minutes on Harry and then we'll, we'll bring her in, then we'll be done. Okay, quiet on the set, please. Uh, you can look at him first. Okay, Harry, just. I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm Harry Cannon. What is? Yeah, just give your name and, the, oh. and what you did. Oh, I'm Harry Cannon, and I was uh, in the Range Safety Division at that time. And uh, at that point, I was a fairly new individual here. I came in the uh, summer of 57 and was primary safety officer on the uh, Navajo, Beaumark, and <coughs> Vanguard. And <coughs> so when I was, first uh, missile I ever was involved in was a Beaumark and then following that was a Vanguard. 
And un unfortunately, on the Vanguard, uh, we were T minus 10 minutes in holding for nearly uh, 36 hours. Now, those times were not completely, that's a holding time. That doesn't mean the time before you picked up the count or notified that you were going to have to go to work. But it was a, it was a long se session. And uh, <clears throat> as uh, the Vanguard finally was ready to fly, and the reason for it not being able to fly during that whole period of time was because of a communications interference. And it turned out that when I came here, I came from Thule, Greenland, where we had just pre previously installed an FPIS circuit, which is a forward propagation of the ionospheric scatter. And also, before I left up there, they had moved the receive station and from uh, Loring, Maine, to just outside of Boston. And when we found out that the Navy could not find out where all this interference was coming from, I was down at the communications set and looked at the thing and looked at the frequency and I says, my golly, this, this is an actual skip from Boston to the Cape. And the next thing to do was to find out how we could turn it off. Well, I knew the commander up at, uh, uh, oh, in the, I can't forget the name right now, but I called him and asked him if he could turn off the communications. He said he could, everything cleared up and we picked up the count. Everybody was happy we were going to launch the Vanguard. Unfortunately, we got down to T minus zero, it lifted off and blew up on the pad. And following that came the uh, Army with their effort with the Explorer 1. Now, the memories of the Vanguard explosion were fresh in your mind. Now, you were responsible for then sending a destruct signal to destroy the rocket yeah. if it stirred off course. What were your thoughts then? Were you thinking about the explosion well, at the time? I mean, I felt very bad about it because uh, Everybody was eager to get the, uh, the Vanguard into orbit, but uh, unfortunately it didn't happen. And also it was, we realized that there was a lot of information back because right after that the, the President of the United States announced that the fact that the Army was going to, to fly the first uh, satellite. And because of his input from Von Braun and Medeiros, the fact that they could do it within 60 days and the pressure was on the President so much because of this, that he had to let whoever could do it, do it as soon as possible. And now your role during Explorer 1, you were at what location? I was, I was in central control as backup to the safety officer. Safety officer was uh, a major at that time, Fitzpatrick, who was a graduate of West Point and retired as a full colonel. And any outstanding memories of Explorer 1 itself? Well, when it, uh, we found out it was actually in orbit, we were all pleased because we knew the pressure was on the, uh, the, the whole country that we get a satellite in orbit as soon as possible. Okay, Harry, I think that'll do it. I don't think we have any more tape.